Hello, I am Lee Kondarachi, and I thank you for tuning in to my presentation. For a bit of background, I was compelled to write this paper after seeing a poster for a local theater's production of Shakespeare's Measure for Measure in my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. The image on the poster immediately reminded me of another image, a political cartoon inspired by the graphic testimony of sexual assault survivor Christine Blasey Ford. I had a visceral reaction to both of these pieces, and this paper came out of that. In the time since I wrote this piece, I saw the production advertised by that poster, which gave me a lot more to write about, but which is outside the scope of this piece. Consider this paper, if you will, the tip of the iceberg, an introduction to my ongoing research on artistic and media representations of sexual violence. This is Violence Against Violence, Artistic Representations of Sexual Assault in the Me Too Era. According to a representative from Baltimore's Chesapeake Shakespeare Company, this marketing image for their 2020 production of Shakespeare's Measure for Measure was not deliberately intended to evoke this political cartoon by Bruce McKinnon, printed in the Halifax Chronicle Herald during the 2018 confirmation hearing of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. But for those who still remember the cartoon, and with it the gut-wrenching testimony of Christine Blasey Ford as she described the violence done to her by Brett Kavanaugh, the resemblance is striking and disturbing. For background, in July 2018, Brett Kavanaugh was nominated by President Trump to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. After his nomination, a woman named Christine Blasey Ford wrote a letter to her senator saying that Kavanaugh had sexually assaulted her when they were both in high school in 1982. Pursuant to this accusation, Blasey Ford testified at Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing, where she described in detail how he had assaulted her. McKinnon's cartoon, which was directly inspired by Blasey Ford's testimony, went viral after its publication. McKinnon said it seemed to him that Republican members of the Judiciary Committee were trying, quote, to smother justice before it had a chance to be heard, and he wanted to represent this. The cartoon provoked a visceral response from some viewers, who deemed it insensitive at best and potentially graphic to the point of doing more harm than good. One Twitter user responded to the cartoon with, quote, I get your point, but trigger much? Another tweet stated, quote, the right thing to have been done with a cartoon such as this is to warn people so that they can choose to view or not. This brought back a lot of memories I did not want to revisit, so thanks for that. Both the cartoon and poster certainly resonate in the Me Too era, but to what effect, and more crucially, with what damage? In this paper, I will discuss how thrusting such images of sexual and gendered violence into the public sphere without warning and without the audience's consent can ultimately cause harm at individual and cultural levels. I will examine the ways in which the quite similar graphic imagery in McKinnon's cartoon and in the promo poster for Chesapeake Shakespeare's play undermines the artist's supposed anti-violence intentions. Finally, I will offer some considerations regarding how to speak out ethically and thoughtfully against sexual violence in artistic media. Now before we talk about these specific examples, it's important to understand how seeing violent images can potentially have a trigger effect, causing acute distress to those who view them. In a 2015 article, feminist scholar Angela Carter discusses being triggered as a mental, emotional, and physiological effective response. This is not the same as simply feeling uncomfortable dealing with particular topics. Being triggered is an embodied response. As sociologist Ragi Bashanga describes in her 2020 piece, it can result from a collective inherited trauma. Bashanga notes, quote, at times triggers are sparked by the memory of one's own experiences. Other times it is the social cohesion or belonging to the category of women or gender nonconforming persons and recognizing the power relations entrenched in everyday patriarchy. It is important to understand, as Carter notes, that being triggered is not an abnormal or wrong response and that a trigger warning can be useful to help people navigate experiences or content that may cause a trigger response. Now, over the last several years, there's been an ongoing debate in academic and public spheres regarding the concept of triggering and use of trigger warnings for content that's graphic or violent in nature. And much of this discussion has originated within feminist scholarship and activism to address the pervasive sexual violence within cultural media and artistic texts and the potential of this causing further harm to people who are in marginalized groups. 
Gender and sexuality scholar Jack Halberstam has pointed out that the broad use of trigger warnings often does not account for differences in lived experiences of trauma. It would indeed be presumptive and a reinscription of current structures of power and oppression for a singular group or entity, say white feminists, to declare holistically what is or is not triggering for everyone. It is essential to understand the nuanced and intersecting ways in which trauma manifests and is inherited. However, as Bashanga notes, sexual violence is a common trigger for many women and gender minorities living in patriarchy. I would suggest that using the term content warning could serve as a heads up about graphic material, but without being so assumptive about the impact it could have on the viewer. As Bashanga and Carter both discuss, being made aware of potential triggers does not infantilize and coddle audiences, as Halberstam and other critics have suggested. Rather, it empowers them to make a conscious choice about what they view, and as Bashanga notes, it does not necessarily dissuade them from engaging with graphic material. Women, and particularly those who are non-white, queer, trans, disabled, and or economically disadvantaged must learn to navigate a world that is full of constant triggers, and most of the time there is no warning. However, if an alert is provided that indicates potentially graphic content, the viewer can fortify oneself and practice the self-care that is necessary to actively engage with that material. Of course, McKinnon's cartoon and the Measure for Measure poster were both published and circulated without warning of any kind, and this is the problem. But, you may ask, how would one offer a content warning for a standalone piece that's meant to quickly grab attention and make a statement? The answer is, you kind of can't. So that's why we, as artists, need to be extra conscious about how, when, why, and for whom we present images of sexual violence in our work. A political cartoon and a poster for theatrical production obviously serve different but not entirely disparate functions. Both seek to catch the eye, to call attention, to draw the viewer in. Both may aim to provoke, to affect, and even to disturb the viewer. More on this later. A primary difference is that a political cartoon exists in and of itself, in its entirety, with all of its message presented at once for consideration and discussion, while the purpose of a theatrical poster is to entice the viewer to buy tickets and come see the show, in this case the production of Measure for Measure. But does the image on this poster do that? Digital and print promotion for this production touts Measure for Measure as Shakespeare's Me Too play. And it's clear that Chesapeake Shakespeare wants to stress the topicality of this piece. For those who aren't familiar, Measure for Measure contains depictions of patriarchal violence, male abuse of power, and sexual predation. The piece feels particularly resonant in the Me Too era, and the poster for this production makes it clear that it is being presented as a Me Too play. The letters M-E at the beginning of the repeated word measure are highlighted in red. In the background of the image is a line from the play, spoken by a sexual predator to his victim. Who will believe thee, Isabel? So apparently this piece is trying to comment on sexual violence and on the suppression of women's voices. But does this poster entice audiences who are interested in current sexual politics to come and see the play? Now using images of violence towards women to sell things is certainly nothing new. The practice has been well studied and well documented by writer and activist Jean Kilborn, among many others. As artist and critic John Berger and others have discussed, objectification of the female body to satisfy the male gaze pervades Western artistic and media tradition. This poster caters to the male spectator who is intrigued and even excited by images of women being objectified and violated. The poster is a curious and disjointed thing in that it references the women in survivor-centered Me Too movement, but its imagery follows the tradition of privileging and attracting the male viewer through objectification of the female body. As Kilbourne has discussed, exposure to sexually violent images and advertising can inform individual and cultural attitudes towards sexuality, sexual assault, and gender, ultimately working to normalize and perpetuate rape culture. It is disappointing and disconcerting to see this tactic used to promote a production that is ostensibly anti-sexual violence. 
Recent studies, such as Lowell Bushman's 2015 work published by the American Psychological Association, suggest that images showing sex and violence may have a negligible or even negative effect on consumer behavior when it comes to actually buying products. So, even if the image on the poster makes people take notice, this does not mean that they will come to see the show. It is possible that this poster may even turn people off from seeing the show. Thus, they will miss any real anti-violence message present in the production itself. But not only does this poster have dubious efficacy as a marketing tool, it also stands to do harm at a cultural and community level, and also potentially to individual viewers. When I reached out to Chesapeake Shakespeare to inquire about the poster design, their marketing manager explained, quote, we wanted something to make the viewer question the scene, take a closer look at the image, decide what is happening, and to let them have a personal emotional response to it, whatever that may be. The image is arresting, surely, and it grabs attention. Seeing it on a marquee or billboard or in an email inbox would make people pause. It would probably make many have an emotional response, and yes, it could cause some to question what is happening and why they are being confronted by this violent picture without context or warning. More critically, though, seeing this image could cause distress to viewers. The poster shows an image of graphic violence, of silencing women using physical restraint to do so. Furthermore, it represents and evokes the historical and contemporary suppression of women's voices through systemic, hegemonic, patriarchal dominance in public, political, and private spaces. It is a vivid, multi-layered representation of rape culture. And for that reason, it is potentially triggering for those who have personally experienced sexual violence or the collective trauma of living as women in patriarchy. Similarly, McKinnon's political message seems to be anti-violence, but his cartoon depicts a graphic assault. McKinnon has said that he watched Christine Blasey Ford's testimony and, quote, felt like he was being strangled. This is the same reaction that some viewers had when they saw his cartoon. As one woman tweeted, quote, it is physically hard to breathe looking at this. McKinnon told the Washington Post, quote, as a cartoonist, I deal in symbols, and Lady Justice is a powerful one. This quote encapsulates a key issue. McKinnon treats the woman's body here as a symbol, an object. The woman in his cartoon is not a person, but a medium for him to communicate his opinion and his message. He doesn't consider that women spectators may view this cartoon and identify with the woman who is being assaulted in it and that this may cause a visceral, possibly even debilitating response. Because the male gaze and the male spectator are our cultural default, artists may subconsciously or automatically orient their work this way, even if they do not think of themselves as doing so. Creating art from a female subject position that speaks to women's experiences requires intentional and deliberate disruption of traditional artistic conventions, including the violent objectification of women's bodies. Though they purport to condemn gendered violence, both the Chesapeake Shakespeare poster and McKinnon's cartoon cater to the male gaze with their depictions of assault on women. In doing so, both of these pieces stand to alienate and possibly do harm to those who have experiences with sexual assault. Even with the best of intentions to combat violence, thrusting images of graphic violence upon viewers who may not be fortified with proper preparation or understanding without their consent is in itself a form of violence. Now, perhaps some might look at these images and think, that's not that bad. It could be so much worse, they might reason, and this isn't really what they'd consider graphic. Perhaps, in some opinions, it's not that bad. But isn't this the same rhetoric we regularly use to silence and gaslight victims of sexual assault and harassment? It was only an attempted rape. Not that bad. He only propositioned you. He didn't even touch you. Not that bad. We have normalized rape culture to the point where some people can probably look at those images and not give them a second conscious thought beyond that initial attention grab. But exposure to visuals like this may have a subliminal and cumulative effect on viewers' perceptions, as Kilborn suggests. Even if the intention is ultimately to work against sexual violence, using a sexually violent image as a promotional tool and circulating that image reinforces the perception 
that violence towards women is commonplace and acceptable. Western culture has been desensitized to images of sexual violence and gendered violence for so long, and this has been exacerbated by the proliferation and consumption of mediated representations. The Me Too movement has started to resensitize us, and this is a good thing. Feeling the impact of violence is necessary for making cultural change. Yes, we should be disturbed by images of violence, but beyond disturbance, what is the intention of presenting the image? Not only that intention itself, but how it is framed and communicated are all crucially important factors when depicting violence. Yes, we are disturbed, so now what? As Darrow Titel notes in her 2019 work, The Theater Feminist, A Manifesto, the portrayal of suffering does not end suffering. As artists, we often use representations of violence to make socio-political statements against that same violence, but the representation itself is not enough to create change. There must be some call to action, something in the art that compels the audience to do work to mitigate or undo the violence being depicted. It isn't clear how or if McKinnon's cartoon or the Measure for Measure poster achieve this. Artists must be very mindful of how we manipulate and present bodies, most particularly marginalized bodies. When and how is it appropriate to depict acts of sexual violence upon women's bodies in artistic spaces and media? Bruce McKinnon, a cisgender man, decided that it was his prerogative to do so. And though a number of people have said they found the work harmful, other respondents have called it, quote, necessary. News outlets such as the Washington Post have deemed McKinnon's cartoon, quote, powerful, which does not, in fact, preclude it from also being damaging. According to a program note from Chesapeake Shakespeare's managing director, a few people have called the Measure for Measure poster too disturbing, but others have said it is brilliantly distilled. In both of these examples, the artists have used violence against women to gain status and power in the eyes of some audiences while further marginalizing those who are already victimized by gendered and sexual violence. The conversation surrounding how to ethically, responsibly, and effectively create art that speaks to sexual violence is ongoing and developing. We can work towards this goal by foregrounding feminist theory and practices as presented by scholars, critics, and artists such as Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Jill Dolan, Laura Mulvey, Lynn Nottage, Susan Laurie Parks, Jenny Holzer, Carol Walker, and so many more. Creating art that centers women and survivors as subjects and as spectators. A key question to ask when we are depicting sexual violence is whom is at risk of being harmed by exposure to this content? Do those at risk include people in marginalized groups such as women, rape survivors, people of color, queer people, or disabled people? Who stands to benefit from depictions of sexual violence and in what ways? If the goal is to educate or inform privileged audiences, must this be done through the manipulation and violent presentation of marginalized bodies? Artistic spaces can be used to work through, confront, and incite dialogue surrounding vital sociocultural issues, such as sexual violence, but all of this takes great care, attention, and willful engagement from artists and audiences. Accosting audiences with harrowing, uncontextualized images of assault is simply not the best way to facilitate this conversation. These images may resonate, but what trauma is it that makes them resonate? Do we really want to recall and reinscribe that trauma all in the name of what, of selling a ticket? Or perhaps with the ostensibly nobler intention of speaking the truth via visual messaging? The thing of it is, we already know the truth. If we actually listen to survivors of sexual assault, we know that patriarchal violence is real and pervasive. We didn't need a cisgender man's overtly graphic political cartoon to tell us that Christine Blasey Ford's trauma was and is real, or that our political and justice systems fail survivors. We don't need a ham-handed poster for a Shakespeare play to reinscribe survivors' collective trauma and to remind us all again. We need to do better. We need to stop recklessly using graphic images of violence towards women in our arts and media, especially when our aim is to end the violence. 
and we must create artistic space for survivors to tell their own stories. Thank you so very much for attending my presentation. I greatly appreciate any feedback you may have to offer.